Hospital Corpsman, third class, James Randall Henry, United States Navy, Vietnam. I interviewed James in Mountain High, California. It was April of 2006. And I interviewed several veterans at that time there. And uh, he was a Navy Corpsman attached to the 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, and also attached to the 1st Amphibian Tractor Battalion, Alpha Company, 1967, 1968, where he received a Bronze Star for his actions. On July 15, 1967, his platoon came under heavy fire, suffered many casualties. He was wounded himself, but he treated a lot of wounded Marines and helped them to safety that day and received the Bronze Star. So God bless him for his actions. But through his eyes and ears, folks, another Vietnam story. Just a great honor to have met James. I believe he's still with us today. He was 60 years old when I interviewed him almost 18 years ago. So in his late 70s now, and hopefully doing well. I want to thank Charles Alisio for sponsoring this story and making it possible for you to learn about James's uh, service in Vietnam. Thank you for stepping forward and helping me share this story with my YouTube family and on my radio station. Chuck, I really appreciate your help and uh, your dedication to our country and to our veterans. It's much appreciated. Hope to work with you again. Folks, I'd like to encourage you to sponsor a story, donate to my work, or to my radio station, Voices of History Radio. There's information in the video description, the comment section, and on my website, LarryCapetto.com. I could use your help in all those areas. It would be greatly appreciated. So another story, another one of my unsung heroes, James Henry, Navy Corpsman, Vietnam. It's a great story of what he went through, folks. And I hope you can share it with a loved one, with another veteran. And subscribe to this channel. Let's keep this thing going, okay? God bless you. Were you in Vietnam? I was there 67 and 68. Okay, and two what, years. What? You were with the Army? No, I was with the Navy. Oh, so. I was okay. a Navy corpsman attached to two different units. The uh, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, and I was also with a, an Amtrak battalion later, later in, in the second year. Okay. And uh, how old are you now? I'm 60. So you were how old then? Well, like I turned months? I turned 21 uh, when I was in, in Vietnam. In fact, it's my 21st birthday. We were actually in Okinawa, and two of my Marine buddies decided that they were going to get me drunk. And I've had a couple of experiences, <laughs> you know, that were funny looking back on them, but not funny then. Okay, so your first time in combat situation when you're over there, right? So you're over in Vietnam. Um, what do you remember about what, arriving in Vietnam? I mean, just briefly, was it what you thought it was going to be, or was no? It, it was actually scary. I, I they timed their arrival, the flights to arrive during the daytime, so that they would not be as visible, and so that. Because they were getting snipers at, at, at times. We landed in um, in Hue. And then I was uh, taken from Hue to wherever I was going to be. I forget exactly where it was. but. So tell me a little bit about your involvement as a, as a corpsman and as you were assigned or were attached and went into the field and what... Just start walking me through what, what you experienced as a, as a corpsman uh, in Vietnam. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a Navy corpsman, bear in mind that I was with the Marines. The Marines do not have medical personnel per se. They, they borrow their, their help from the Navy. 
The fact is the Marines don't like to admit it, but they're actually part of the Department of the Navy. But anyway, um, so it was my job to be with a unit, and I was with Kilo Company, uh, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, and the 3rd Marine Division. And spent several days just getting acclimatized. You know, the weather was different, and so we have to uh, get used to it. And then we issued our gear and assign and get to know everybody, and you go out on patrols. Patrols can be anywhere from a couple hours to a couple days long. And in the meantime, you uh, treat casualties, take care of the people. Not only treat casualties, but you've got to monitor for things that might happen. You know, people going into PTSD or PS, whatever it's called, post-traumatic stress um, or, or battle fatigue or whatever. You know, if, if, if you see the signs, you've got to do the proper things, get, let the people know. Tell me now, you're with the Marines. Um, what, what about the casualties? I mean, tell me what you would come upon, firefights, what have you, casualties, and, and, and then your involvement treating the wounded, actually, on, on, the, on the scene. Well, you know, the one incident in particular, it was my first combat death. The fact is, his name is on the memorial wall, and every time it, every time it comes around, I go, I go visit. But... I've I've also written a story about it that I wish I, I, I would I, I wish I thought to bring it. Um, it's all it's been printed in the Navy Times or n not the Navy Times the the Veterans Magazine. Um, it tells a story of how you know we have all this training, we're we're trained how to survive in combat. We're trained to how to use weapons, how to use our first aid gear to keep people alive with blood expanders and everything, but yet at this this guy got hit with what they call a dum-dum. Uh, a dum-dum is, is, a, is a round that has been modified or manufactured to explode and make a big, big mess. It went in, went in uh, up on his uh, shoulder and came out the bottom of his back, but it kind of tore away his back. Here he is bleeding to death with all my blood volume expanders and everything. I call for a chopper. They say that they can't fly him out, but yet 20 minutes later, they're flying in a chopper to bring us more ammunition. You know, it, it seemed kind of ironic that they would let somebody die, but yet at the same time, bring us more ammunition to, to inflict more pain. You know, that, that, that to me and the fact that he was only two weeks away from the, the from his uh, the end of his enlist of, of his tour and he had a, a young wife and a young daughter at home and you know I just it got to me it it still does but that that was the most the most traumatic fact it, it was my it was my first my, my first actual casualty, so I think that's m one of the reasons why it stood out in, 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 in my mind so much. Sure. What kind of wounds were you treating? Everything, from minor scratches and abrasions to headaches to traumatic amputations. People, people getting their legs and arms blown off. Well, uh, we had one instant that there was a, a guy who during a rest period, he was he was sitting down. He 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 put his weapon beside him. He was kind of relaxing, smoking a cigarette, and a sniper shot at him and hit his weapon, and it blew up his whole magazine. And of course, he had shrapnel, but uh, he was he was never the same. With with within a month or so, we we got him out and flew him out. Unfortunately, I don't remember a lot of names. I wish I did. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just trying to imagine what you're telling me now. Are we talking head wounds, chest wounds too? I mean, uh, everything. Shrapnel. Everything. We. Is I've, it just yourself with a platoon, or what are you? I I'm with a platoon. Mm -hmm. 
The fact is, I was wounded twice. I've got two Purple Hearts, I've got the Bronze Star. Um, tell, me, tell me what happened to get the Bronze Star. Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've got the, the certificates and everything and, and, and the statements, but basically what it was is we were in Shulai, uh, which is um, near the DMZ. <clears throat> we were uh, taking fire. We were told to take Hill, I think it was Hill 31. Hill 31, it just means that it's 31 feet above sea level. That's, it's it just out in, the, out in the middle of the desert, that's the way to designate a, a sand dune. But we were taking casualties. One of the casualties was on one side of the sand dune. I leaned over, pulled him on the other side, and just as, just as I got him over on the side, a, a mortar round landed underneath me. It was buried itself in the sand, and the sand basically absorbed all of the explosion. I got a little bit in my arm and then uh, moved. I was with uh, an Amtrak battalion at that time. Amtrak is an amphibious vehicle that is capable of operation on land as well as water. They, about 40 miles an hour on, on land and maybe four or five miles an hour in, in the water. And they, they sit low in the water, big thing. They look like a tank, but they're, uh, basically they're an armed personnel carrier and are armored, rather, not, not an armed. They have basically a machine gun or, or some small, I mean, uh, small weapons on top to uh, protect themselves. But one of them was designated as, the, as a, it was, it was designed and configured as a battalion aid or a medical tractor. So they were called tractors. So we, I, I took casualties back there and we treated them and got them out. And, you know, but that's, that's what happened. I, I was treated there myself. Um, so you're with platoon, I mean, are you trained for these situations? Obviously you are. Are you trained? You, you pretty much knew someday you're going to be no. working on wounded? I mean, no, as a Navy corpsman, I, I joined the Navy and during boot camp, you're given a battery of tests to find out what you, the Navy thinks you would be best suited for. They give you five or six different choices. Well, one of the choices that I have or that I had was to be a dental tech. Well, I hate dentists, so I decided not to be a dental tech. Number two is um, I could have been a, a, a storekeeper, but I've got a little problem. It's called dyslexia. I sometimes mess up n numbers, especially sixes and nines for some reason. And sixes and nines are very important because a lot of the uh, numbers that you deal with start with 6505 or 6950 or whatever. Uh, so I decided not to do that. I could have been an electronics tech, but to Navy standards, I'm colorblind. Even though I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, ham, a ham radio operator and I, I, and I still do Mars work. Uh, um, but anyway, so but the only choice left to me was to, to be a corpsman. Hospital corpsman, after, after boot camp, we went to school. It's a it's five days a week, about four months, solid, uh, every day. Uh, learn everything from, the course titles are Materia Medica and Toxicology, in other words, how the medicine reacts with your body. Physic, you know, uh, you, learn, you learn body parts, you, you learn first aid. The fact is you come out of school License or not licensed, but certified to be an EMT. So you could you could actually go on and do that later on in life. But then, during during uh, during that time, field medical is part of part of the program. You actually go out in the field. They do mock-ups. They're called moulages, where they. They're fake body parts. Is what they are. Wounds, and, and you treat them, and that's part of the physical. That's part of the exams that, that we're given. And the very high standards, because if you don't get a seventy or above, you can lose your school. Well, I, I, I passed. Not not high, but you know it's beyond seventy-five anyway. Anyway, then um, 
My second assignment, I, went, I actually went to a naval hospital, a little, little naval hospital in Newport, Rhode Island. I was there about six or seven months, and I got uh, orders to go to um, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. This is the field, <coughs> excuse me, the first medical technician school for the, for, for the Marines, where you're sent, you learn marine technology, you, you learn, to, learn to survive as a, as a Marine, but it's geared to the fact that you're there to learn field med. It's one month long. It's, it, it, it's seven days a week for a month. We go, actually go out in the field and we practice with Marines. We uh, learn how to fire the different weapons, uh, learn the nomenclature, learn how to you know, basically survive as a Marine. And then from there, we're assigned. Mm -hmm. okay. Going to Vietnam and Okay, so you know one thing, Jim, that I want to ask you about is uh, tying in my story with the uh, Army and the Marine uh, helicopter pilots, uh, the troops, and the, the helicopter warfare. Tell me some situations about the wounded that you treated and, and calling in the choppers and, and loading them on the, the, the skids and all that. Tell me, tell me about uh, the ships. Tell me about any of that that you were involved with. Well, fact is I have, I've had two helicopters shot out from underneath me. We, we were being, being flown out, I'm not sure exactly where, I think it was toward uh, Dong Ha, I think, but I'm not sure. We were in, going into the jungle, we, we took fire from, from snipers and it actually set the helicopter on fire. Helicopters are made out of a magnesium alloy so they burn very, very quickly. We, we, we went into auto rotation. That means that the chopper is spinning around and, and the blades are going in the opposite direction, but it's, it's basically crash, a controlled crash. And we started jumping out of the, out of the uh, helicopter. Be, there were about 30 of us. We started out, out the back door before the, the chopper had hit, but we jumped into sawgrass. Uh, sawgrass has very sharp edges, so, and then, of course, we had, had to go set up a perimeter, and I went around to make sure that everybody was okay. Got a little minor. N nobody was really hurt on, on that one, but then later we had to land a chopper uh, so, so we could fly out an individual who had a sucking chest wound. He got hit, sucking chest wound. We flown, flown him down to Dong Ha, which is the... Uh, we had a field hospital mm -hmm. set up. It was similar to a MASH unit. I'm, I know that, that you're familiar with MASH, the program MASH. It's similar mm -hmm. to, to that. Uh, we had some hardbacks. Basically, they're tents that are supported by, by, wall, by um, frames instead of just tent posts. Um, they're a little bit more permanent than a tent. But we had some hardbacks, we had some must units. Um, he was taken, I, I got flown back to my unit so I could rejoin, but I was there, I, I got flown in with him to administer uh, first aid on the way there. We were, it was about a 30 minute chopper ride. Okay. But that 30 minute chopper ride saved uh, several hours worth, worth of ground transportation. Chuck, or what are you on? No, I was on a Chinook. Okay. It was, it, it, uh, it, it's the, the two blades. Right. And we also used the Jolly Greens. They, they look like a big old grasshopper. Um, we did have Hueys, we used them for, a lot of times, if there was one or, t just one or two casualties, we could fly them out on Hueys. But on this particular case, the, the one, the, the Chinook, we had uh, five casualties, so we took them all in at once. And fortunately, the the area had become cold. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, we weren't being fired at anymore. So it, it was a cold, cold LZ. Mm -hmm. Was there any chaos of, or was it chaotic at all when you were treating casualties? Like you talked to these World War II guys and a lot of the things they worked with, even some of the Korean stories. But 
was it pretty um, sporadic fire? Were there times where there were big firefights and then there were a lot of casualties? Were they yelling for corpsmen? I mean, what's going on? All the time. In fact, is that my, my, first one, my first one, corpsmen up, corpsmen up. And I go there and, and find this big, this, this guy laying down with blood coming out of, uh, out of his back. Pack it as, as best you can with, with battle dressings and give him morphine so he doesn't go into shock. And we have a, a product, it's called um, serum albumin. It, it's basically human serum that has been um, sterilized and you don't, it doesn't require refrigeration. It's a blood volume expander, making your blood, giving the red blood cells and the white blood cells more volume so that you can survive. Um, give it all we could and at the same time, several other corpsmen. I wasn't the only corpsman with the unit, but they're, they're out treating other casualties. They're staying low, trying to keep their heads. Uh, I was the inquisitive type and I had to be pushed down a couple of times. Um, when I first went there, I did not know it, but there were two Riflemen assigned it to me as as my cover. Um, if if I went, they went. If I went to if I went out to collect a casualty, they went with me. I did not know that they were actually assigned to me. I thought that they were just there. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm still friends with one of them, and uh, he's he, he lives in uh, Michigan. But it it could be very chaotic. Depending on where you were, whether you were in the jungle, whether you were at the, in out on the uh, sand, out at the sandbox, uh, you know that that's out at the Quaviat uh, at the uh, mouth of the river that uh, that's, that designates where where the uh, DMZ started. You know, we actually went into the DMZ. We could make patrols in there, but we were not supposed to set up camps or anything like that. North Vietnamese came over and in, into the DMZ. We tried to stay away from each other, but you know, DMZ just means that we can't set up any military fortifications in the DMZ. What are they firing at you? AK-47s, what are they firing? Small arms, mortars, rockets, um, you know, a, a, some AK-47s. We had, we picked up some Chicom hand grenades that hadn't exploded. The fact is, we even found a couple of the old German potato mashers uh, that, that they were using. Um, some of the landmines they set up, the fact is I've got some shrapnel in my leg because of one, it's called a bouncing Betty. Uh, they used a um, thing called punji stakes. I've got pictures in, 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 my, in my album here. Um, a bouncing Betty is figured like a shotgun shell that is inside like a, a coffee can filled with explosive. The shotgun shell blows the explosive up about chest high and then that explodes. Well, fortunately, the primary charge is the only one that went off. The main charge did not go off. So that's why I'm here today because it bounced up between me and my bodyguard. He he tripped it, and it was a, it was actually a vine stretched across, and it and it, it bounced up and uh, a little pop. We hit the ground, but it didn't go off. But I got, I got uh, uh, some of the uh, it was rocks and and things in, in my leg, some shrapnel. What was the hardest part of your job as a corpsman in Vietnam? Seeing people die all around you. Uh, Knowing that you have the expertise, you have the tools, but sometimes it didn't work. Um, there was a movie recently that um, I won't go see. In fact, is I will not see some of the movies because it it brings back to me the sights, the sounds, and even the smells. I can see a movie. Some of them, some of them I can watch. You know the 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 Van Damme movies and things like that, but um, I won't I won't see some of them because I know what it's going to do to me. 
I'm one of the fortunate that I did not have too much problem, but I went through a period of time when I came back that I didn't want to be around anybody. I just, I, I had to be away. One incident when I came back, my, my high school invited me to give the open, opening ceremonies on the opening day of school. I, I walked over. Uh, I only lived about a mile from the school, so I, I walked over to the school, was on my way there, wearing my dress white, my dress white Navy uniform with all my medals and ribbons and, and everything. About three or four blocks from the school, there was a work crew that was working with a compressor, and I knew they were there. But all of a sudden, it, it, it let loose, and it sounded like, to me, a machine gun. I threw myself on the ground and rolled into the gutter. I was observed by several different people, students. They were laughing. They were cutting up, and then I realized what I had done. I continued on to the school and talked, and I went and, and, and told the um, ROTC guy, who, had, who he was the person who invited me to, to, to participate, and my uniform was filthy dirty. It did not look presentable at all. But he told me to go up there anyway. Just before I, I went up, he told what had happened. And some of the, and that I had I was just returning from from Vietnam from I, this is while I was on leave before I had gone to my next command and several of the students afterwards one of one of them was was a young lady she apologized but I've had experiences coming back people got spit on laughed at fortunately I was not physically attacked but there were times that I felt like I was the only person out there. I was the only person. I knew in, in, in my mind that there were more people who have, had experienced the same thing. But in my mind, I was, the, I was the only person who knew what was going on. So I had to get away for a while, so I did. Well, that kind of brings me to a question at the end of the interview about the homecoming. Did you receive a homecoming when you eventually came back from Vietnam? Or Actually, I surprised my mom and dad. They did not know exactly when, what day I was coming. When I came back, up, up to that time, they always announced that where they were going to come in at. But there was an incident in one of the civilian airports. I'm not sure where it was. I think it was L.A., they always announced ahead of time that, that there would be a flight coming in from Vietnam, you know, or returning soldiers. And one of, one of the soldiers, as he stepped off the plane, was shot by a sniper at L.A. And he rolled down and died. Now, after that, they started flying us into, in, into secured military bases, into like Travis or or in, into Moffat or into, uh, you know, uh, Alameda or places like that. But what happened was is they, they flew us in, to, they, they flew me into Travis, and then we took a civilian plane that they had designated for us and flew us down to uh, San Francisco. It was on a Sunday. I had the taxi drop me off in front of the church. My mom and dad did not know I was home. And I walked into the, in, into the back of the church. The pastor knew who I was and, and everything like that. And then he made the announcement that I had just walked in. So that was my homecoming. In other words, I, I made chaos in the church one day. <laughs> <laughs> but, that was, but we considered that very acceptable. Do you think there were things that you saw in Vietnam on the battlefield that you've just forgotten about because they were so traumatic or yes yeah search and destroy missions where we deliberately set homes on fire uh, I couldn't see a need I know that sergeant Ka our yeah sergeant Kelly got in got in Trump I think it was sergeant I, anyway uh, Kelly lieutenant excuse me lieutenant Kelly at Milai got in got in trouble 
grow over those and uh, uh, doing things that uh, I've seen some deliberate torture that I've tried to forget, especially some of the females that uh, were deliberately tortured, not only by us, or by them, but by us also. Um, I think it's wrong, but... Did it ever come, become routine for you to treat the wounded Marines, or was it always a, uh, a new experience, or, I mean, again, the type of wounds you're treating, and, um, were you comforting these Marines? Were you um, treating them, and then where would they go after you treat them? Depends on where we were. There were times that some of them went to a battalion aid station, which was a, a small behind the line, so to speak. In Vietnam, there was really no lines. Uh, in, a, in a relatively secure area, they, they would set up a battalion aid station for a day or two. Basically, it was a tent that was designed. We would give first aid, then they would go and stabilize them. And then from there, they were transported by truck or by jeep ambulance or by helicopter back to a an a further aid station like um uh, like like charlie med or delta med at uh at, at da nang they had one at way um so you know it they were more of a stable hospital uh then sometimes they they had operations there just enough to take care of the of the immediate, and then probably they were flown back either to San Francisco, some of them to some of them to Hawaii, to Tripler, to 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 uh, different places in the United States. I know that some of them were then further evacuated to if they needed long term care back to a facility near their home. Um, some in Chicago, some in uh, down to San Diego some to, um, the Chicago would, would be Great Lakes. <clears throat> the ones, um, they could be, there, there was one in Florida, San Diego, Naval Hospital, Oakland, brought back a whole lot of them. In fact, it's when I, uh, later in life, I, I was at the Naval Hospital when they brought back the POWs. I was involved in repatriation, re, repatriation, whatever, of some of the, uh, people from from POWs. I got to meet them and talk to them and, you know. Jim, tell me, in the remainder of my time, tell me of some specific um, cases where you administered to the wounded and what, what were you doing? I mean, tell me if you're starting IVs, you're doing um, blood plasma. Give me some specific examples of the wounded that you remember that you were treating there. Uh, as I, I always go back to that one casualty that that I remember. Giving him a, starting starting the IV of the of serum albumin, trying to trying to save his life. You know, we had sucking chest wound. We had backs blown away. We've we've had legs lost, using tourniquets. Anything we could do to to stop the blood. I'm 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 sorry that I real I really everything to me centers on that one casualty because it was the most traumatic that I have ever seen, other than the burns from the white phosphorus. I've seen patients that were totally totally burned. All their the skin gets it gets actually burned off their body because white phosphorus is very very potent. In fact, it's used even today. Um, white phosphorus is, uh, when it's exposed to air, it continues to burn. You have to uh, take take away the air. But it, we use everything: punji stakes, punctures through the leg, through and through bullet wounds, uh, loss of an arm, a leg, um, faces get blown away uh it's just in some ways it's very traumatic to talk about and in in my case fortunately i had an outlet i i could talk about it some people hold it in i i sometimes get it get very emotional i, I start talking and i i, I lose all 
I just start rambling like I'm doing now. But to me, that the the most traumatic one was was that, was that was that one person that was my first casualty. I lost him, and I felt I felt so down. I wanted to kick myself because I couldn't save this guy. All my training, all this technology at our at our command, and yet it. it all this blood is just seeping through my fingers into the ground, and it, he he lost his life because of it. A a little girl does not have a father. Other wounded, though. I mean, are, you've you've shared that example, but like if someone gets their face blown off. What do you do when you get to a situation? You, what can you do? Well, basically, you. You put a battle dressing on, try to stop the bleeding. It's, a battle dressing is like a, a big pad of cotton that is in between two layers of gauze with big old long ears on it that you tie it on. You don't, we, tape didn't stick in the field very well, so you use a battle dressing. The battle dressings are in different sizes for, you know, and then you, basically you stop the bleeding, try to, uh, there's really nothing in the field that you can do except first aid. And then they're evacuated back to back to a battalion aid station where they're, they're stabilized a little bit better, maybe close the skin flap if there is any. From there, they're, they're given more blood. They're given m more definitive treatment. And from there, they're sent to the hospitals for surgery, back for cosmetic surgery. You know, it, it's a long, drawn-out process, but you, you, do what, you do what you can in the field. What, I, what, what, what are the wounded Marines, if they're conscious, what are they saying? Are they screaming? Are they talking to you? Are they calling for their mothers? I mean, what are they doing? Oh, a lot of them, one in particular, that he, he, had his, he had his hand blown off, and he wanted to go out and kill the MF. He wanted, uh, obviously, he would, ha he would have died very shortly if... If we had not put a tourniquet on, you know, to to stop the bleeding, get him out of there, the adrenaline rush, the uh, anxious anxious to to go out and do different things. Some of them ball like a baby. I know Marines are supposed to be big and tough and everything, but they they call for their mothers. They several of them call for for their wives, their their sweethearts, their. Um, some of them are praying. Some of uh, some of the uh, Marines had never prayed in their life, and then they're 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 talking to God or Buddha or what or whatever you know whatever helps them. Give them morphine. Morphine is just to help keep them out of shock. Keep them you know keep their blood pressure stable. Or try to help stabilize the blood pressure. Get them out as soon as possible. It was it it was basically sometimes um, scoop scoop and run, Some, it, scoop them up, do what you can and get out. Uh, we never left a person behind. My group, I know the people ha have have been left behind, but the, uh, either they're missing in action or whatever. But we never purposely left anybody behind. We always carried our casualties out. So are you just waiting for someone to get wounded and then they cry Corbin and you go? I mean, you're just kind of like on call type thing? I'm, I'm, with, I'm with the unit. I'm actually issued a weapon, even though we are designated a non-combatant. But that weapon is officially to protect yourself and to protect your patient. Sometimes you go into survival mode. If it's, if it's either you or them, it damn sure ain't going to be you. So I mean, you you go into self-preservation mode. A couple of times we went out. They could bring us water and ammunition, but they wouldn't take our casualties. We had we had to maintain our casualties as much best we could until they we to a situation that they could safely fly them out, or we could get them out on a um, on a car or 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 bus, or you know we we had. A couple times we had a the Arvin units. The um, Arvin unit is the is the South Vietnamese Army units. They helped us a great deal. 
They had jeeps that we would put them on and they would take them back to their battalion aid stations and then take them over to our, you know, they would treat them as best they could and then get them to ours. So we, we, had, a, we had good rapport with, with the Arvin units. It's the, Arvin is the Armed, Repu Armed Republic of Vietnam. It was uh, South Vietnamese. Are there any other stories that in your mind that you could share with me just to, as far as the, 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 the Marines that were wounded or I know you're kind of giving me a general idea of, of what kind of wounds and you know what, what had to be done but are there any, I, I've never been a corpsman so I'm asking this question, but are there any specific, like a lot of the World War II guys told me stories that were just you know very touching but um, how they saved them and some they couldn't save. But are there any other men that come to mind that maybe that you treated that come to your mind that you can tell me about? There are a couple that in, to, to, to be honest, I don't, I don't remember their names. Well, that's fine. And I had a letter not too long ago sent to me by a former uh, Marine wife. Her husband has died. He found, she found my, one of my names in one of his official records that I had treated him. Um, she searched through the uh, websites or whatever and found my name, found, found, I, I got this through, it, it through a, a series, uh, you know, mail it, to to somebody, but they they don't know where I am. But at my last command, and they they forwarded it on and on and on. It was it 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 took five years for the letter to get to me. But the, she did thank me for 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 uh, saving her husband. Um, again, I, I I wish I'd have saved the letter, but gratitude is there uh, from the right people, and I'm just glad that I I spent 22 and a half years as a Navy corpsman. Most I spent in in Vietnam, but we also later in later in my service I was on board ship and you know all visited the the country and but there there is a place that I would like I would love to go back to Vietnam now, but I, I wish it were in a different situation. Sure. Tell me just briefly about the Vietnam Memorial Wall in Washington, if you've been there, and what your emotions were when you were there. I haven't been to the big one. Mm -hmm. I want to go very badly. Not too long ago, there, I went to, I've, I've been to it twice. Once it was in Berkeley. It was a, it's the portable wall that is, that's making the rounds. It's made of anodized aluminum to to mirror the the wall in Vietnam in in Washington D.C., all of the names are actually in um, it's gold leaf that has been uh, put on on these aluminum plates. It's the same. It's a smaller scale, but it's the same at the same time. We went to Berkeley, and of course, to get to the wall, I walked through a a, a big protest. There was. They, uh, Berkeley you know, is a college that they, did, they don't like anything to do with Vietnam. But this was on a very interesting situation that uh, place it was located is in Berkeley. And part of, this, of the Berkeley High School, where it was, a little corner of their property is actually in Oakland. Berkeley would not allow the memorial to be shown in Berkeley. So the high school students sponsored it, set it up on the on the corner in in Oakland, that 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 we were there. Then recently it was in the Santa Clara Memorial Park, across there off of uh, Kylie in Santa Clara, and I went there and I spent two hours. It was early morning. Um, I'm a ham radio operator. I mentioned before, and we we were holding a a network, a a, a, a California wide network, live from the from the memorial. We were talking to vets all over California by radio, mm -hmm. talking about the people there, and that was very 
uh, mem memorable to me. And I, I always go back to that. Again, I'm sorry that the name, I just know the position on the wall where he's at. Sure. Can you tell me briefly about the drug usage in Vietnam? Was there, did you, were you around it? Did you see it? My unit was fortunate. We did not have a whole lot of it. But marijuana was common. Uh, as I say, my unit, the two units that I was with over there, it was not a high thing. However, alcohol was, you know, we, we could get the, the local brew, the bami ba, the uh, rice wine, thing, things of that nature. It, it, it was, it was a, a high usage. We had people drunk all the time. Um, but again, the drug usage was not that prevalent. That's my unit, though. Yeah, and then you, again, I base that on stories. You hear stories, you hear about this and that. Yeah. We, we had a couple of uh, incidents where Marines would get, excuse the term, pissed off at their um, commander. We, we, we had a couple of incidents where they would frag their a group you know, th throw a grenade in, into the into the stove and have it cook off, and you know we had a, we had a couple of incidents like that, but um, it was not prevalent. We had a couple of guys run off. They, far, they're they're still listed as officially, as far as I know, as MIAs. Mm -hmm. They basically um, run off into the jungle and never saw them again. You be, are you proud that you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes. Do people thank you for what you've done? Not too many. But it's, be, it's become more and more prevalent. My son right now is in the Army. He's over in Iraq for the second time. Uh, just got a phone call from, from his wife that she had got a phone call from, from him. Uh, we're a very close family, so she keeps us informed. And there's a possibility that he may not be home for another nine months. And he's already been over there the second time nine months. They're getting, getting ready to move to a new, a new location. He says it's, it's in Pakistan. It's over near Iraq somewhere. We don't know what's going to happen. So, but this is his second tour over there. Uh, he's... He's, he's undecided as to whether he's going to continue his career. He's been in 10 years. He's, he's at a turning point right now, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my son. I come from a family that my, my brother is a retired Air Force. He was... Uh, well, Follow-up questions here. Now, um, when you came home, I mean, did you forget about all the, the, the things you did as far as a corpsman, or did you, did you kind of refer to, but did you have any problems, or did you just go on with life and, and forgot about it, or what? No, I, I was living at home for a while. Even, even though I had, um, when I come back from Vietnam, I was assigned to a different hospital, and that's in St. Albans, New York. I was still going through some problems, so when uh, I got out, I, I said to heck with it. When I, when I came home, I, I dipped into my savings account, bought a car, paid six months of payments, six months of insurance, and I told my mom, don't even look for me. I don't even know where I'm going to be. I wandered the Midwest. I took off driving. I never knew where I was going to be from one day to the next. I spent about a month and a half just wandering. And then, and then uh, I came back. I had a little studio apartment that I had paid, it, paid in advance. Told the landlord I, I didn't know when I'd be back. He says, as, as long as I kept my rent paid up, he, he didn't care. But I wandered. I, I finally came to the realization that I couldn't wander. I had to get back. I had to get back. So, but I'm, st I'm still in the medical. I, I work at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Um, I'm one of the um, multiple trained per people over there. Uh, I, I work in the emergency room. I, I, I'm also a certified EMT by, by uh, national, I got national certification. Uh, so I've, I've maintained what I learned, and I, I, I have used some of the survival techniques in, in my camping. I like, I like camping, so I, I, I use that. You know, it, it's, it's not for, for nothing. 
Sure, sure. Um, what does freedom mean to you? I mean, being a, a Vietnam veteran and living in this country, what, what does freedom mean to you, Jim? Freedom means that I have the right to say what I want about who I want and not having to answer to anybody. I, if, I, if I wanted to tell the president that he's a jerk, I could tell him so and not get in trouble. If I wanted to give, give my ideas on a situation on how to, how, to, how to better this country, I can do it without having to, to go through channels. I could just write a letter mm -hmm. or I could come out on, on public and, and tell it. The fact that I can live my life and live and and support my family in any way that I want to, any way that, in a way that I have helped, pay with memories and, and things that intangibles. What about the price for freedom? You saw all these wounded and dying Marines, and I mean, what do you have to say about the price for freedom? Sometimes I questioned it. The price is high. But if we're not willing to pay the price, then we don't deserve to be in this country. If we can't do things correctly, uh, I know that we're going right now through immigration things that, and we talk about this a lot, a lot at the hospital because we, we deal with immigrants and with, with people who are quote unquote undocumented. And my feeling is that you have the right to immigrate to the United States. However, do it correctly. Don't break the law. What does the American flag mean and represent to you? Red for the blood of sacrifices, red for the purity of the nation, and blue and, and all the stars, the unity. And there's a star for every state. No one star represent any other state. No star represents, uh, is, is higher on the flag than anybody else's. It just means that we, we are 50 states, unified, and to me that, if, if you notice the construction of the flag, the blue is sitting on a stripe of red. We have paid for our freedom and the blood of many, many people. I'm going to go back one more time and ask you this question about the casualties. Just, I mean, is it like a blur to you? It sounds like you were you, you treated a lot of people, but it, working in that field, that profession, I mean, do certain certain um, individuals come to mind, or is it all kind of one big blur? I I, I know you refer to the first one, but right? And I understand that. Just every everybody, you know, I I could not come to account. I don't know how many casualties I've treated, we, we lose count, and numerous, because, you know, after, even after I came out of the field, it was tradition that we were in the field six months, and then we would get pulled out of the field, go to a battalion aid station or to a hospital. So even, we are even treating the patients that have come in from the field. So it's too numerous to count, but we have... Any, any number, pick a number. You know, it, 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 it yeah, it, it is a blur. Mm -hmm. But you don't remember somebody you held them in your arms, they died. You were helping a guy with his leg, or I mean, it's just all one kind of. No, it, 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 it's just a blur. I, I mentioned the, the one about about the the casualty who got shrapnel because he his rifle got shot uh, instead of him. Uh, the, the casualty that my first casualty I've I've seen I've even treated some Vietnamese prisoners, mm -hmm. and some of the Marines didn't like the fact that we treated them the same way we treated our our own people. They they wanted to go in, in and kill them right then. And the fact is, we had guards set up outside of the of of, of the unit that they were. So to prevent some of our Marines from, I'm not talking about Navy corpsmen. Navy corpsmen are a different breed. Um, the Marines wanted to go in and kill them in their bed, uh, shoot them right there, stab them with a bayonet. But we, we had, um, 
both Vietnamese and Marines guarding the prisoners so that we treated the prisoners the same way and then we, we evacuated them to the same places. I don't know where they took them in. You know, I know that we had a POW camp somewhere in Vietnam, but I don't know where. And one more time about the helicopters. Normally you, you would treat, they'd be evacuated back to the aid station or whatever. You didn't really call in choppers. Well, you did that one incident where they wouldn't come, but for the most part, you were just in the field. You had nothing to do with the... No, I, 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 would, let, I would let my command know we need a chopper. The radio men would... He would take, he would take care of, of the actual duty. Uh, we had to know how to call it. I mean, once the chopper came in, we had to know how to direct it, you know, using the hand signals, using a smoke grenade to designate a safe zone. If, if we used a, a white smoke, it would, that, that actually marked where, where the chopper to land. And then they circle overhead. If, there, if all of a sudden it becomes a hot zone, we'd pop a red, a red smoke and they'd, they'd fly away because they couldn't come in. It was, it was just our way of visually signaling to the chopper pilot, it's safe, it's not safe, or whatever. And were you, did you assist in, in loading the wounded and yeah. the choppers? Yeah, we did. Can you tell me just a little story about that? Or? Well, the, we used, in the field we didn't carry litters because they were, they're too bulky. The litters were brought to, were brought out to us by the choppers, but a lot of times we would make, you know, you drag the, pay, drag the person by, by their shoulders or, you know, keep their head off the ground or whatever so it wouldn't bang around, but, you know, at physically take the, pay, the patient. I know, that they're, I know that they're casualties, but in my, in, in my profession, everybody is a patient. We'd take the patient to, to the chopper, put them on the litter. The chopper crew would, would strap them down so that they wouldn't fly around and then fly off. But it was a, it was a, a common thing for everybody. It, it's an all hands evolution. We carry them to the, um, again, because the litters were actually bulky. You wouldn't want to carry a, a big litter around with you all the time. Uh, it was useless. We had a, a litter that it looked like a, a big piece of um, canvas that had handles on the side that, that we, we could roll up and, and stick in a backpack. We, some of the units carried them. I carried one for a while, but uh, every, every, every Marine had a poncho, and a poncho could be used as a, as a litter, uh, four corners and carry them. So uh, we, we all carried our ponchos, we all carried, uh, it's, it's, a shelter, it's a shelter half, it's a half of a pup tent. You snap two of them together and it becomes a tent for two people. Uh, we, you could use a shelter half as a litter, you could, you know, we improvised, did, did what we could with what we had. Mm -hmm. Carried them out, put them, on, put them on the chopper, put them in the, in the bus, put them on the, on the uh, uh, ambulance. Not in really, it didn't have a siren and, and all that, but it was, a, it was a Jeep that was designed to carry patients. Give me one example, if you can remember, about a hot LZ, and, and was there a lot of adrenaline, a lot of tension? Was it chaotic? The, the, the one chopper that was shot out from underneath me, we were landing. It was... Uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had about 20 or 25 people in the chopper. I'm not real sure how much. We, our mission was to uh, do recon on this one area. We didn't know exactly what was in there. The, the elephant grass or, and the, the saw grass was about 15 feet high, so we didn't really know where the ground was. And there were snipers. They, they shot the chopper down. Um, yes, it was chaotic. Uh, we got rid of the, of the snipers within a few moments and then, it was, then, then they, could, uh, they called in another chopper to take out our casualties and but we had cuts and we had bruises and some burns because the chopper was burning. Um, basically we let it just burn out. Uh, it, it was easier to do it that way. but. Uh, the chopper is, is filled with fuel and it's made of a magnesium alloy. It's, it's got all kinds. So we, we had several burns. We had cuts and bruises and um, we had only one bullet wound that in, in, that, in that situation. 
but it was it was through an arm, up an upper arm. So, so he, uh, w within six months he was he was back to active duty. Just about maybe one two more questions. Uh, when you're treating the wounded, Jim, um, you know you come across somebody where you were you starting IVs too? Were you giving blood and were you doing? You said something about emergency amputations. I mean, what are you using and what are you doing? Well. Emergency amputation. We had a, a guy. His, his arm was just blown off. And another one with his leg. The only thing that you can do is you put on a tourniquet, put on a battle dressing on the end of the end of the stump to, to control the bleeding. What's there? Uh, if it if it bleeds through, you don't take it off. You just put another one over it. You know, you want to save all the blood you can. Just uh, put a tourniquet on as tight as you can. Keep him safe. Give him some morphine. Um, Keep him out. Keep him out of shop. Keep keep him calm. Uh, get get him evacuated. And, and a traumatic amputation is really nothing more you can do. Uh, that that type of situation is was was common. You know, uh, arms and legs obviously are the most visible parts of a, of, a, of a person, so they lose them quite quite easily. Did you sleep at night after a day like that? I still am very sensitive to noise. I wake up at the slightest sound. A lot of people have difficulty waking up. You know, they sit up and they yawn and scratch themselves and, you know, do all of that. But me, I wake up, I sit up on my bed, and I go. It, it's just the nature that I've gotten used to as, as an emergency, as an EMT, as a paramedic you learn to to get up and go uh, even even at home now there's no no time am I really down uh, I can be I can be asleep in my in my easy chair my wife will walk into the room and I'm awake how about in Vietnam though after a day of treating casualties could you sleep at night then not well not well, and sometimes you you second guess yourself. Did I do it right? It, would this guy be alive if I if I did this instead of this? Um, do a lot of second guessing. That you know that to me is. Th that's what happened to me anyway. You know, did I did I do right? Was I absolutely right? Could I have done something else? Did you follow up on any of these guys? Or? Usually no, because. A lot of times we didn't have we didn't have the time, um, and the evacuation system was set up so that as soon as they they leave our uh, leave the field, they're they're taken to a battalion aid station. They're there sometimes minutes or hours. They're gone to the hospital, and maybe they're only there a couple of days, and then they're then they're brought either out to the hospital ship repose uh, where. They're, they're taking maybe maybe they're a week, and then they're flown off to Hawaii or to or to San Diego or, or wherever. So it would be very difficult to to trace them. Some of them have been traced, but uh, other than the two that I mentioned, I I have not followed through. I'm gonna work at the end of the time here for my uh, interview, but I want to ask you to do one more thing for me. I asked all the veterans to do this if you can. Can you give me, when I tell you, can you give me a salute into the camera when I tell you? Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim, right in the camera. Great.